I want to share a word with you today entitled, You Are Special. Amen? Amen. You are special. And it's okay that you are special. I am special. And it is okay that I am special. We have been created special. Amen? Created by God in the image of God. This in and of itself, if there was nothing else, the simple fact that the creator of creation has created us, and he has created us in his image, gives us value, worth, purpose, identity. It makes us special. Amen? Amen. Amen. If you'll turn with me this morning to 2 Kings in the fourth chapter, I'm going to read approximately the first six verses. Be reading out of the New King James this morning. 2 Kings chapter 4, beginning in verse 1. A certain woman of the wives of the sons of the prophets cried out to Elisha, saying, Your servant, my husband, is dead. And you know that your servant feared the Lord, and the creditor is coming to take my two sons to be his slaves. So Elisha said to her, What shall I do for you? Tell me, what do you have in the house? And she said, Your maidservant has nothing in the house but a jar of oil. Then Elisha said, Go, borrow vessels from everywhere, from all your neighbors, empty vessels. Do not gather just a few. And when you have come in, you shall shut the door behind you and your sons. Then pour it, pour the oil into all those vessels and set aside the full ones. So she went from him and shut the door behind her and her sons who brought the vessels to her and she poured it out. She poured out the oil. Now it came to pass when the vessels were full that she said to her son, bring me another vessel. And he said to her, there is not another vessel. So the oil ceased. The oil ceased because there was no more capacity. There was no more capacity in the house to receive the oil. The scripture is very clear. The, the oil didn't stop for any other reason but the fact that there was no more capacity in the house to receive the oil. The flow of the oil is about the capacity of the vessels to receive the oil. It is about having enough unique vessels to receive oil. Vessels which are not full but are empty. Empty vessels that will receive oil. So often so much is made in ministry about the anointing that is on the jar. Oh, you know, I want to go to this meeting because there's an anointing on that preacher. There's an anointing on that jar. There's such an anointing with that person. It's no matter how much oil is in the jar. Only as much is going to be poured out as there is capacity, room within the vessels to receive it. It is, it is so very common to go to a prayer line and have people come up for prayer, especially following a message, following a word. It, it is so common to go and pray and to begin to feel the power of God moving through. And whether it's an impartation, it's a healing, it's a gifting, something, God's just simply His power, His peace wants to overwhelm someone with love. And they begin to receive and then you can feel them close up. You can feel them begin to resist. They, it, it's as if they've said, I've got enough. No more. And it, it may not even be a conscious decision. It may be a learned or a conditioned or a trained response that, that says that, that, that oh, I'm, I'm not worthy to receive that much oil. Or, or, or I'm a little afraid of what will happen if that much oil flows. I may not be in control anymore. And, and, I, and, and I tell you, if you've ever been in that place, when the Spirit of God is moving and you are praying for folks and you are laying hands and you are speaking prayers and you can literally feel the, God, the power of God, the, the anointing of God, the impartation of God moving through you, literally the Holy Spirit, and you can feel a person resist and it just stops. 
And sometimes out of love, we, we try to pray a little longer, pray them through. But if the vessel won't receive the oil, mm -hmm. it doesn't flow. You get some others that'll come up and, and, and they want prayer and, and they're just like, I'm empty, fill me up. And, and boom, and that impartation comes and sometimes it's like a bolt of lightning, sometimes it's like a flood, but it just... Poof. It's not the jar. It's the vessel. It's, it's the capacity of the vessel. It, it, is the vessel empty? Is the vessel prepared? Is it ready? God has created us, each and every one, a unique and a special vessel. There, there, there are no two vessels alike. Every one of us is created with capacity for His oil. Every one of us is created with capacity to carry something. That would be a more accurate statement. Every one of us has been created. The potter has, has handcrafted each one of us upon the wheel. And He has handcrafted each one of us with a capacity to carry something. Now, his plan would always be that we would be full to overflowing with his oil. But sometimes we get full of something else. Come on, somebody. There's a lot of other stuff that can fill us up. And it starts to reduce that capacity. The oil stops flowing when there is no longer room to pour. This can be on a corporate level. This can be on an individual level. The only way the oil stops flowing is when you run out of vessels with capacity. Whether it's one or none or a whole bunch. He said to her, there is not another vessel. And the oil ceased. He could just as well have said, there's no more capacity. Everything is full. Some are full of water. Some are full of pepper, some are full of salt, some are full of something else. Don't know what it is, but the ones that would receive the oil are full, and the oil stops. We, we talked last week about this anti-spirit, this anti-Christ spirit, this unholy spirit, this anti-spirit, this Jezebel, as some have labeled it, we spoke from a much deeper, a more global perspective. We spoke from a more prophetic, a more biblical perspective. And we said that, that part of the reason that we want to throw Jezzy out of the house, part of the reason that we want to get this Jezebel, this unholy spirit, out of the house and out of the vessels is to make room for the true Holy Spirit to come. Amen? If, if the vessels are filled up with too much of the unholy spirit, that, that takes up room that, that should be the Holy Spirit. Right. If, if, if the atmosphere is, is choked up with this unholy spirit, then where is the capacity for the manifestation of the Holy Spirit? Now granted, the Holy Spirit is far more powerful than the unholy spirit, but, but capacity is capacity. We are vessels. The atmosphere of this place. This is God's house. It is, it is a vessel for His presence to be experienced. We fill this atmosphere with, with, with brokenness, with, with Jezzy and, and all of her cronies. All of this unholy stuff. All of these distractions, this mess. And we reduce the capacity the room for the Holy Spirit. And we are a people who want the Holy Spirit. One thing we know about this place, it, it, as much as, as this ministry has been through, as much as this ministry is still going through, as, as long as the messages are, as, as long as we go in worship sometimes, as much time as we spend in prayer, you're not still here unless you're really after the Holy Ghost. Amen? So we know in this house there are good people who desire the Holy Spirit of God. Let us empty every unholy thing that is unique and special vessels created in the image of God by God. Literally pottery formed by the potter upon the wheel, clay in His hand. 
Not that we should ever look at him and say, why have you formed us this way? Or do you have any idea what you're doing? Of course the potter knows what he's doing with every vessel. And he's never made two the same. We are all created by God in the image of God. This alone, in and of itself, communicates the great worth and great... I mean, nothing is greater than God. There's no greater worth, purpose, value. There's no greater thing in creation than the Creator Himself. And we are created by Him, for Him, in His image. Every one of us, every one of us, you are created in His image, His express image. You are special and beautiful. You were created for His glory. It is okay to be special. It is okay to say, I am special. Let's say it together. Say, I am special. I am special. Now let's say it like we're excited about it. I, I am special. special. Let's say it like the church hasn't beaten it out of us. I, I am special. special. You know, sometimes I think we, we get into this place, this, this, this wicked trick. There's this wicked trick, particularly, it's, it's a particularly wicked trick of, of Jesse. And I say Jesse, meaning Jezebel. This, this particularly wicked trick of Jesse is to attack you with your own gifting. To twist and lie and distort. You know, when Satan came and challenged Christ in the wilderness, he brought the word, but he twisted it. This, this Jesse is a twisting deceiver. Takes the gifts, the words, twists them. One of the most wicked, cunning, clever, craftiest tricks of, of Jesse is to use your gift against you. Literally, we see people, we, you know, we, we understand in the Word of God that it's a blessing to be humble. But sometimes we confuse humility, meekness with timidity. The Bible says that God has not given us a spirit of timidity. But many translations say He's not given us a spirit of fear. But what it says in the original language is God has not given us a spirit of timidity, but of power and love and a sound mind. You see, the fruit of Jesse is consistently confusion. Jesse's fruit is consistently confusion. Confusion in your own mind, confusion in your own heart, in your own life. You get confused. You say, well, I feel like there's something special about me. I'm going to stand up and do something with that. And then a voice says, you're arrogant. You want the attention on you. You think you're something special because you have a gift? It's not very humble. It's not very Christ-like. I didn't see Christ hiding behind rocks. I saw him standing in the market square proclaiming the truth. Yes. Boldness. You see, there's this, this delicate balance. And, it, and I believe it's really been distorted by this anti-spirit. In our person, in our flesh, oh, we have every reason to be greatly humble. And we should be humble yeah. in who we are. It is great that we are humble as individuals. But the Spirit of God that is in us, Christ that dwells in us, we boast on Christ. The difference becomes that, that we don't boast on ourselves. There's nothing in and of ourselves, of our flesh to brag about, to boast about. But there is everything in the person, in the calling, the anointing of Christ that we should boast. We should say, there is something special in me. There is a special calling upon each of our lives. There is a special anointing upon each of our lives. There is a special presence in each of our lives. This Christ, this Messiah, this Holy Spirit that dwells in us. And, and if we buy into the lie that says, well, don't, don't, don't think too much of yourself. 
we tend to let it shut everything down. Literally, the gift that God has given us, that the world is to see, that is to be proclaimed, that is to go forth in service, we say, oh, well, I, if I do that, then, then it'll be like I'm out there. And so I just, we get confused. That this, this, this Jesse comes and accuses us of pride, accuses us of having wrong motives and wanting to be out there. And you know what, if we, if we want to be out there so that we're seen, yes, we do have the wrong motive. But if we want to be out there that He is seen, if we want to be out there that His gifting, His calling, His anointing is on display, that is for His glory. That is for His glory. And that is good. But, but Jesse will come in and twist that and lie to us. It is having confidence in the unique talents and gifts that we've been given. And making sure that we don't allow the lies to suppress and to stifle that calling, that gifting, that anointing. And, and we need to constantly monitor ourselves. We need to constantly be in check and say, am I doing this that, that I may be seen or that he may be seen? Am I doing this for my glory or for his glory? Is this in my strength or his strength? Is this my purpose or his purpose? But I think all too often, I mean... It is the spirit of Antichrist, which means it's opposed to Christ. So it is kind of understandable that every time that Christ begins to work in us or through us, or be seen in us or through us, that the spirit of Antichrist would come and oppose us. And it brings immense confusion and frustration. It's extremely confusing when you're attacked with your own gift. It, it, it's why the enemy attacks our identity. It's why the enemy attacks our self-worth. It's why the enemy seeks to invalidate children particularly through fathers, through absent fathers, through abusive fathers. Because the enemy knows that if, if he can attack, invalidate, injure, wound that child as a child, then either that child will not grow into an adult, or if it grows into an adult, it will grow into an adult that, 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 that is not confident, that's not validated, that's not affirmed in its gifting, and its calling, even in its existence. You've heard people say, I, I don't even know why I'm alive. I don't even know why I was born, or I don't want to be alive, I don't want to be born. Wait a minute. You were created by God, for God, in the image of God. That's why you were born. But if that validation, if that worth, if that awareness is not there, if, if the understanding that there is a calling from God Almighty on every one of us, there is a gift or gifting or gifts from Almighty God placed within every one of us. And every one of us was handcrafted. There are no two people on the face of the earth who have ever been the same. Even identical twins have different fingerprints. Identical biological twins have different fingerprints. They come from the same seed, and yet they have different fingerprints. There is no two people. No one else was created on the face of the earth ever with exactly what you have and who you are. Meaning you were created to do something that no one else was ever created to do. How tragic if we abort that creation in the womb and it never sees daylight. But just as tragic is to birth that child and bring it into the world and then allow it to be spiritually aborted through abuse or ignorance or lack of understanding or validation in purpose or to even allow this anti-spirit to come and crush the life the gifting the calling out of that vessel confusion results one moment you think wow god is amazing i am called and gifted and the next moment you think, wow, I'm arrogant. I don't know what I'm doing. I'm confused. And listen, there is no minister that ministers that doesn't have those crashes. And I think sometimes the higher you go in that anointing, the harder you crash. If I could show you how many leadership articles there are on pastors about Monday morning. <laughs> Pastors, just there are so many articles and different things written for pastors about how to survive Monday morning. Monday mornings can get so black after Sunday. 
Confusion is a consistent fruit of Jezebel's presence. It's an absolute war of lies. These are lies. They cause doubt and confusion that ultimately leads to frustration. We, we get frustrated, we get confused because that lie, we feel incomplete because we're actually fighting ourselves. We're fighting the gifting, the calling, the very thing that we were created to do, we're fighting that within ourselves because this anti-spirit has lied to us about our worth or our purpose or our value or his used our gifting against us and said, you just want to be heard, you just want to be seen, you just think you're all that, you think you're special, you think you're better than other people and stuff, you need to be humble, you need to be Christ-like, you need to sit down and shut up, you need to be in the background, not seen, not heard, you know, otherwise you're just putting the attention on you and not on Christ. And that confusion comes and, and it shuts us down and then, and then we... We feel incomplete because we were created for this special mission. And the moment that we begin on this mission, we, we begin to feel complete in Christ and in, in joy and peace. And, and then something shuts us down and we turn away from that. And now we've turned ourselves away from what God has called us. And we're literally fighting that completion. And somewhere deeper down inside, we may not know why, but, but we know that we feel incomplete, unwhole somehow. We're laboring. Let us not be deceived anymore. Let us walk with our head held high in Christ. Rejoicing in the fact that indeed every one of us is created special with unique gifts and talents. Truly anointed, truly called, truly blessed but not for ourselves, for His glory. As long as we keep that one, just that one little thing, we acknowledge that we were created by Him, for Him, in His image. That His glory be revealed in this earth. That He be glorified in the heavens. All of creation declares the glory of God. We are just a part of that creation. The stars declare His glory. The heavens declare His glory. The mountains declare His glory. The seas declare His glory. The forest declares His glory. You and I declare His glory. The thief comes but not but to kill, steal, destroy. Maybe it would help us to understand that the thief comes not but to embezzle, to misappropriate. He can't create. He doesn't have the gifting or the power that we have. But he comes twisting and lying and deceiving, sowing the seeds of doubt and fear and timidity and confusion, causing us to use the very gifting that is within us against ourselves and against others. This jezzy, this divisive, destructive thing seeking to divide us from ourselves, seeking to divide us from our brothers and sisters, seeking to divide us in fellowship, saying, what's wrong with you that you think you're special? It, it, this, this lie is so pervasive. This lying, accusatory, anti-spirit, Jezebel spirit, as some would call it, attacks the notion that we are special. It literally attacks the notion that we are special. It says that everybody is the same. Think about how global, how national this attack is. It's not just on you and me. It's not just on a ministry. It is on this nation. The very communistic scheme, the, the, it is a scheme of the enemy. The Bible says no weapon formed against you. There are plots and schemes formed against individuals, against ministries, and I got news for you, against nations. And there are spirits and principalities and powers that are set to oversee those schemes, those plans and those purposes. Just as God has dispatched angels to care for every one of us, so too has the enemy dispatched his angels for his destructive purposes. There is a war in the heavens. Make no mistake. We war not against flesh and blood, but against principalities and powers. Spirits that be. 
There is a there is a scheme against this nation, this culture. It is a communistic type thought process. It says everybody's the same. Do you realize how fundamentally fundamentally anti-biblical that is? I mean, it may feel good in the flesh. It may feel right in the natural to say, hey, everybody's the same. Everybody is not the same. We may have equal value in God's eyes. We may have equal love from God, sinner or saint. The worst heathen in the world and the greatest saint that's ever lived, God has no more love for one than for the other. But we are not the same. We are not the same. And we don't respond to God the same way. Amen. It is anti-biblical to say that we are all the same and that we deserve the same, whether we do the same or not. Whatever. This is a, a communistic, anti-biblical message. And there is a reason that it is creeping into our government and our culture. Satan has launched a multi-prong, multi-front assault upon this world and upon this nation. And he knows that to get this world, he has to go through America and he has to go through Israel. There is two, it is no surprise that the two most hated nations on the face of the earth are America and Israel. The two most condemned, criticized, and attacked nations are America and Israel. Oh, by the way, America and Israel feeds the rest of the world. We give away more in food and aid and support and medical care than the gross national product of most nations. It's what we give away. God has blessed this nation as a Christian nation that it may care for the world. Of course, Satan wants to destroy the people and the nations that are caring and feeding and sharing the gospel. This is not a coincidence. There's nothing accidental about this anti-spirit, this anti-Christ, this Jezebel, as some would label it. This notion that, that everyone is the same, everyone is created the same, everyone is the same, is an anti-biblical notion. It actually denies God His glory. Think about the glory due to a Creator that creates billions of human beings each one, every one, individual, unique, purposed, planned, gifted, called, special. What a tapestry. What a God. God is not a communist. He's not. Don't believe it, check out His Word. It says, don't work, you don't eat. The Word of God literally says, if you don't work, you don't eat. Now that doesn't mean somebody that's maybe physically infirmed or somebody that, that maybe is trying to work and just can't at the moment, but somebody that just sits back and says, eh, feed me. And don't work in God's program. It may work in some man's program, but it doesn't work in God's program. We are here with a calling, a job, a task, and work to do. And, and, and that work involves... Working. Go figure. A society based upon the principle of the redistribution of talents and wealth is contrary to biblical teaching. Did not the Lord say to some he gave ten talents, to some, or to some he gave five talents, to some he gave two talents, to some he gave one talent, and each was to give account for what he did with his talents? A couple things stand out to me in that message by the Spirit. First of all, I don't find anywhere in there that no one was given any talents. Or anyone was given no talents. Everyone, some were given more talents than others, but everyone was given a talent. I find in that message that not everyone was expected to do or accomplish the same thing. Yet there clearly was an expectation that everyone do something with what they had been given. That is really kind of not a communist message. I mean, it should be that they all got the same reward no matter how hard they worked or didn't work, whether they did good with their talents or bad with their talents. Kind of have to conclude that God's not a communist. And that communist 
agendas are fundamentally anti-biblical. And if they're anti-biblical and they didn't come from God, there's only one other place they could have come from. This attack against families, against fathers, against morality, against individuality, it is literally attacking the very creation itself. It is Satan's attack on God's creation. Designed yet again to rob God of His glory. We are created in the image of God, for God, by God. This literally communicates great value and great worth in each of us. We are called by Him, anointed by Him, purposed by Him, predestined by Him for good works in Christ. Every one of us is special. Every one of us is a unique vessel. We are special. Different vessels crafted different ways, different capacities, but we are all to have a capacity for that oil, for that anointing, for that Holy Spirit. It is very fascinating to me. This story we shared last week about Jezebel and Ahab. We touched on the beginning and the end. Jezebel and Ahab were joined in union. They facilitated one another's dysfunction. And we went through those spirits, and then we went through their demise. I don't believe there's anything accidental in the Word of God. I don't think it's a coincidence that, that in the midst of that, because we have over here in 1 Kings their union, and then in 2 Kings, many chapters later, we have their demise. Yet there's all these chapters and verses in between. And you know what it talks about? Elisha. It talks about Elijah and Elisha, but especially about Elisha. And you actually start to get this listing of miracles that Elisha did. Bookended by this Ahab and Jezebel beginning their work. And then Jezebel and Ahab and their cohorts being undone. This, I believe, is such an absolute picture of Christ. This Elisha, I mean, I mean it's nothing radical to say that Elisha is the picture of Christ. But, but let's look globally for a moment, contextually, at this section of scriptures. We've got Ahab and Jezebel, this, this anti-spirit, this anti-Christ spirit in the facilitator of this. We've got their untimely demise. And in the midst of this, this, this union of Ahab and Jezebel so much kind of has the flavor of the Garden of Eden. And, and the end of, of Ahab and Jezebel so much has this flavor of the lake of fire. But in between, we've got this story of Elisha. Notice how Elisha begins. He begins by picking up the mantle of Elijah. Elijah was the predecessor to Elisha. John the Baptist came in the spirit of Elijah. Jesus came as he was prophesied and foretold. Elisha was the type of Christ, the image of Christ, the prophetic shadowing. And just as Elisha was preceded by Elijah, Jesus was preceded by John the Baptist. The first thing that Elisha does when he picks up the mantle is he strikes the water and divides it. Jesus said, I did not come to bring peace, but a sword. I came to divide. Jesus literally came to divide the sheep and the goats. He just as Elijah's first work was dividing, Christ says, I came to divide. It tells us that the first miracle, that, that the ministry of Elijah, the first miracle that's recorded in the Bible that Elijah did, he said, bring me a cruise, bring me a vessel of salt, and the barren land will be no more. Jesus was at a wedding feast and said, bring me a vessel of water, and I will make it wine. I, I believe there's a direct correlation between these miracles, and I believe if you look at the miracles of Elijah, you will see parallel references, hints, indications of the miracles of Christ to come. There's, there's a story of Elisha telling them to look into the valley and, and, and to dig water, that, that, that water will fill the waterways. It's very much like the woman at the well. 
And Jesus said, I am the living water. There was an outflowing of water. There's the widow's oil. It's the outpouring of the Holy Spirit. Jesus said, I will pour out my spirit on all flesh when I have ascended. Elisha raised the dead. Jesus raised the dead. Elisha was called the Son of God. Jesus was called the Son of Man. There's, there's a most curious passage where it talks about a pot of porridge that was made, and it was somehow made poisonous. And Elijah cast meal into it, and it became not poisonous anymore. I sort of think of the bread. There was leaven, sin, if you will, in the bread. And Jesus said, I am the bread. There is no leaven, no sin within me. He made what was deadly no longer deadly. Elisha fed a multitude. Jesus fed the multitudes. Elisha was a type. He only fed 100. Jesus was the real deal. He fed 9,000 plus. Amen? Amen? As it's recorded. Elisha cured a leper. Jesus cured lepers. There's a most curious story of an axe head that was lost in the water and then raised. I can't imagine how that's not a picture of water baptism, something being buried in the water and then being resurrected. Amen. Come on, somebody. The Syrians were blinded by Elisha for his purposes, and then for his purposes, their eyes were opened. For the ministry of Jesus, there were some things that were concealed from the eyes, and there were other times that eyes were opened that they might see. Blind eyes were opened. There was such a parallel in this story. There's a prophecy of Elijah in the 6th and 2nd, 7th chapter of 2 Kings. I believe it is, it is a prophetic shadowing of the tribulation period. Go read it. Read about the famine and the destitution in the land and the difficulty in buying and selling. Come on, somebody. I see y'all writing. I see you smiling. It says the preaching, the pastor's preaching better than I'm letting on right now. But, but I, I, I hear the word. Jehu comes. Jehu comes and brings judgment to Ahab and to Jezebel and to their cohorts. Not just to them, but to their house. Jehu is a, is a symbol of the coming judgment. Now, Jehu didn't finish well. But that's just a reminder that Jehu is a type, a shadow. He's not the real deal. There's only one that we worship. There's only one true God. There are types and shadows. We don't worship the type. We don't worship the shadow. We don't worship the priest. We don't worship the image. There is one and one alone that gets the glory. The message may be good from the messenger, but the messenger does not get the glory. It is the author and finisher of our faith. He alone gets the glory. Jehu was a type of the judgment. The glory was not his. Elisha was a type of Christ, but the glory is not his. Elisha received a double portion from Elijah. There is a double symbolism there. Elijah and Elisha in many ways represent John the Baptist in Christ. John the Baptist had a calling and anointing. Christ took it to a whole other level. John said, I baptize with water indeed, but one is coming after me mightier than I, whose sandals I'm not worthy to tie. He will baptize you with the Holy Ghost and with fire. A greater portion. But, but, but special folks, this same Jesus said, the works that I do, you will do and greater shall you do. You see, there's another extension. We as the body of Christ, there is a double portion from Elijah to Elisha. There is a double portion from John to Jesus, but there is another multiplication from Jesus to his body. Come on, somebody. That is so much better. You, we are the body. 
created for his purpose, receiving a double portion, the outpouring of his spirit, his mantle upon us for his glory, unique, precious, special vessels created for his purpose and his glory. With a double portion of his spirit, his anointing, his calling, his purpose in us, that his glory may be seen in the heavens, in all of creation. Say it, say, I am special. I am special. Praise God. Yeah. Created in the image of God, by God, for God. This communicates such great value, worth, and purpose. Know that every child that has been aborted was an abortion of the image of God. Every child, every fetus, every embryo, every young person, every not so young person is God's very image. It's not a rejection of that child, it's a rejection of God. They can call it what they want. It's a rejection of God. And the nation that rejects God will be judged. The individual that rejects God will be judged. But we were not created for judgment. We were created for His glory. We were created special. We were even given grace so that our not so special moments wouldn't overwhelm the specialness for which we were created. We were given His grace, His righteousness, that we may grow, heal, mature into all that He has called us to be. It is the progress, the humility to say, I am not what I will be one day. But also the confidence to say, but I boast in Christ because I have confidence in Him who is called. I have confidence in the author and the finisher of my faith. I may be making a horrible mess out of it right now, but, but, but He is able. He is able to bring me through. He is able to heal me. He is able to fix me, to teach me, to train me, to correct me. He is able, even out of this filthy vessel, to scrub off the mud, to empty the contents, and to fill it with His oil. That He be glorified. Anyone who degrades your value or your worth lies against God. Anyone who degrades or devalues you lies against God. And that includes the moments that you devalue yourself. Oh, it was a lot easier when it was somebody else. Sometimes we lie against God more than anybody we know. We stand in front of the mirror and say, God, what a mess you made. God, what were you thinking? God, you really don't know me or you wouldn't have called me. God, if you really knew what I had done. Oh, come on. He's numbered the very hairs on our head. He knows our thoughts before we think them. He's seen our future before we live it. What do we think we're hiding? And yet, He loves us with a love that is indescribable, unfathomable. We are created by God in the image of God. It's right out of the Bible, Genesis, the first chapter, verses 26 and 27. The first thing we find out about our God in the very first couple of verses, the first revealed fact about God is that He is Creator. That He is creative. And the pinnacle of His creation on this earth. We just went through the 4th of July. Every good fireworks show ends with the grand finale. The, the big reveal. The last thing He did on day 6. Everything was in place. Everything was provided for. Everything was done. Now it was the crown jewel. 
Adam and Eve, he created in his image and set in his paradise for his glory. You and I are created by God in the image of God. This creation, his fingerprints on us, his DNA in us gives us value, significance, purpose, worth. No matter what man, what woman, who has lied, who is deceived, abused, maligned, whatever they have done, it is a lie from the pit of hell. God says, he who is sovereign says, he who rules and reigns says, we have value, we're special, we have a calling, a purpose, a worth that no one but us can fulfill. This is how precious we are. We'll close with these scriptures as we remind ourselves it's not just the jazzy words of the preacher, but it is the word of God that says, Psalm 139 and 14 and the New King James says, I will praise you. That's a good place to start. That's a good place for us to acknowledge His glory. Yeah. Is to say, I will praise you for I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Marvelous are your works. And that my soul knows very well. The New Living Translation says it this way, and I'm actually going to read 13 through 16 so we can get 14 in context. The New Living Translation says, You made all the delicate inner parts of my body. You knit me together in my mother's womb. I thank you for making me so wonderfully complex. Your workmanship is marvelous. How well I know it. You watched me as I was being formed in utter seclusion, as I was woven together in the dark of the womb. You saw me before I was born. Every day of my life was recorded in your book. Every moment was laid out before a single day passed. I will praise you, for I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Marvelous are your works. How different our lives would be if we stood in front of that mirror every day and said, Lord, I'm marvelous. What a work you have done. And if we were able to stand, stand there and say that and believe that and not take any pride in it, we would be mature. Mm -hmm. We'd probably be raptured in that moment because none of us will be perfected in this life. But think about it. You know, Lucifer stood in the halls of heaven and God's glory was upon him and reflected from him. He worshiped God. And it was okay. It was okay that Lucifer was beautiful and that God's glory was upon him. The moment that Lucifer fell is the moment, not that God's glory was seen in him or on him, but the moment that Lucifer began to misappropriate, began to embezzle, began to believe that it was his glory rather than God's. There is no crime. In fact, it's God's will that his glory be glorified, be seen, be in us, on us, witnessed by the world. We are created special. We are created marvelous for His glory to be revealed, to be reflected, to shine. And we can stand there and say, man, wow, I'm really gifted. He's really called me to something special. He's really anointed me. It's okay as long as I remember it's for His glory. The moment I begin to misappropriate it, the moment that I think of making it mine, Bible says we are headed for a great fall. Amen? Mm -hmm. Headed for a crash. Pride cometh before the fall. Pride. Pride is the linchpin. Pride is the differentiating factor. Pride is, is the teeter on the totter. 
Come on, somebody, that's good. <laughs> it's okay. You say, man, I'm, I'm really special. I'm really gifted. It's not for me, it's for somebody else. Check out what Ephesians, the second chapter says in verse 10. The New King James first says, We are His workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. The New Living Translation says we are God's masterpiece. He has created us anew in Christ Jesus so we can do the good things He planned for us long ago. The things that He planned for us to do. Not so we could use it for our gain, our glory, our fortune, our fame, our pleasure. Now, any of us that's been around the Christian block a couple times, you know that the moment you start giving him glory, there's something that just gets on you. is happiness. Yeah. is peace. Yeah. is goodness. Yeah. The moment that you forget about you and start focusing on him, he starts blessing you. Mm -hmm. I mean, it just, it just feels good. Doesn't it? Mm. I like it. I like it. He said, if you lose your life, you will gain it. We let go of us and grab a hold of him, and all of a sudden, he just pours life and joy and peace and purpose and validation into us. Not because of a name or a title or a position or a work or a birthright or religion or anything we are, but because we are a vessel filled by him with his oil for his glory. 1 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 7, and the New King James says, the manifestation of the Spirit, literally the presence of the oil, is given to each one for the profit of all. The widow was given the oil to spare her sons. Every one of us has a gift, a purpose, calling. Some have multiple gifts, multiple purposes, but they're not for us. They're to bless another, which means somebody else is running around with our gift. It's a good reason to be in fellowship. The more folks we know, the more folks we love, the more chances we're going to find the person that's carrying our gift. It's for the profit of all. 1 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 7, in the New Living Translation. It's a little simpler language. A spiritual gift is given to each of us so we can help each other. Notice it doesn't say that many have received a spiritual gift it says a spiritual gift is given to each of us there's a lie that would say well maybe you just were absent on the day they handed out the gifts <laughs> maybe you weren't in class that day maybe you overslept Christmas morning Maybe you lost your calling or your gift because of the sinful life that you embraced. The Bible says the calling, the gift, it, it, the calling is without repentance, meaning it does not go away. It may be dormant. We may not be walking in it. But when He calls, when He anoints, it's there. So much so that every day we see people using His gift his anointing for the wrong purposes. Many of us, maybe most of us, possibly all of us at some point have used His gifting. I, you know, in that moment, it's so easy to know how Paul said, I am chief sinner among the sinners. If there is anyone I know that has, has misused and abused the gifts and the calling and the anointing of God for selfish purposes, it's me. I know of what I speak. 
but all. For his grace and for the revelation and the understanding that I am special, that I am gifted, that I am marvelously and wonderfully made for his purpose and for his glory. And even if nobody else ever sees it, even if it takes me my entire life to realize it, even if I'm on my very last breath and I recognize in that moment that he did this for his glory and his purpose because he loves me. Yeah. How blessed are we to have this revelation and how destitute and broken are these who do not yet know this. What a message we have to carry forth. What light and, and love and joy and peace and goodness we have to carry forth. Let's not hide His glory under a bushel basket. Let's, let's throw Jesse, let's throw the lie mm -hmm. out of the house. Let's, let's get rid of the unholiness and, and have overwhelming capacity that the oil just continue to flow. That everybody and everything get oily and anointed. That there be reserves and overflow. That when they come in, welcome, Holy Spirit. Father, we thank you for your word. Undo us. We thank you, Lord, that in your infinite wisdom, in your indescribable love, in the absolutely amazing capacity of who you are and what you have done. That you have chosen to value us, to love us, to cherish us, even when we did not value ourselves, even when we did not love ourselves, even when we've not cherished ourselves. Please forgive us, Father. We pray in Jesus' name. We ask you to forgive us for lying on you. Every time we've said we're not good enough. Every time we've said we're not worth it. Every time we've said we're not beautiful. Every time we've lied on you. Every time we've said, I don't know, I don't think I can do this thing. I don't think I can share this word. I don't think I can step out in this place. I don't think I can translate this. I don't think I can reach this student. I don't think I can reach this senior. I don't think I can make this project work. Oh, that's right. It wasn't my idea. It's your purpose, not mine. It's your calling. It's your life. It's your grace. It was your cross. It's your strength. It's your anointing. It's your Holy Spirit. It's your purpose that you purposed from before the foundation of the world. Please forgive us, Lord, for every moment that we've lied on you about ourselves and about others. But Lord, we rejoice today in the revelation that we are special. We are wonderfully made. We are marvelous. And it's because of you. And it's by you. And truly it is for you. We love you, Lord. We ask in Jesus' name that this revelation that this truth would become so deep in us, so complete in us, that we would never waver again, never hesitate, never doubt, that we may take our eyes off of ourselves and fix them firmly upon those to whom you have called us. 
Help us, Lord, not to spend any more of our life arguing with you about whether we can, should, are able, or have value, and that we spend the rest of our lives walking in the purposes for which you have ordained us, for which you have called us, for which you have created us, walking in the overflowing anointing of your Holy Spirit, a vessel that is filled fresh and new every day with your oil, with your love, with your grace, with your mercy, with your anointing, overflowing in the grace and the power and the love and the presence of God. Yeah. Letting no thing defeat us. Letting no thing get us down. Knowing that no weapon formed against us will prosper. For God is with us. Who can be against us if God is with us?